There. Yeah. Okay. How this meeting to order? Please silence your cell phones and whatever so that we can conduct business and stand for the invocation from Council Member Kennedy. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You've all had a copy of your February 2021 financials. Were there any questions or concerns on those? So we in consensus to approve those to be added to the record. Okay. I've also received a copy of the March 2021 minutes. Any cor corrections or omissions or any concerns about the minutes? So we're in consensus to approve those then. Okay. Communications? The first one is the girls on the front submitted an application to use the perimeter of Centennial Park, 413 to 65, on Wednesday and Saturdays from 3.30 to 5 p.m. for their practice. Okay, any questions or concerns on that? Okay, and then there's another one I see. The other one is just um, for informational purposes that the Batavia Youth Baseball has requested to use four youth fields at MacArthur and baseball field at Williams Park every day from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. from March 1st to October 31st. Is that uh, Dan? That's correct. We're going to make sure that he cannot lock the fields. That's correct. Yeah, and that he also schedules with other teams that may want to use that field. Right. Um, they just put in that overarching, and I let them know that they still have to allow other teams to use the field. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions or concerns on that? Okay, now we'll assign some agenda items. Um, item 30, 2021, the temporary superintendent of water and wastewater. Let's get The resolution to allow the community garden to submit to a grant. And a resolution to order a contract for the line stuff. That's the command. The next city council conference meeting and special and special business meeting will be held on Monday, April 26th. 7 p.m. at City Hall Council Boardroom, second floor of the City Center. And just so you're aware, today's business meeting, we'll go, we're conducting that first. The conference meeting is just so that we can get things on at the special business that we'll hold in two weeks. So nothing we're moving today from the conference needs to be voted on tonight. Just so you're aware of that. Okay, that'll be voted on at the next meeting, and it's a timely thing, but not that timely. So we're just going to have a special business to cover if we move these items tonight. Okay, just to make that clear. Um, also, we have a proclamation for retired officer Jason Davis. I'm going to come up here.
was previously employed by the Village of Little Valley Police Department and the Cattaraugus County Sheriff's Office. Throughout his career, he's received many, he served in many roles, including as officer in charge, member of the emergency response team, crisis intervention officer, field training officer, general topic instructor, de-escalation instructor, DARE instructor, and most recently, uh, department school resource officer, and Batavia City School District. Jason also volunteered as a Boy Scout troop leader for many years. Uh, which also DRE? Do you have recognition as well? So yeah, they give a long list. Yeah, that's right out of the paper. <laughs> he served his community and department with professionalism and compassion. He's been a positive role model and mentor to other officers and many more in the community. His positive impacts and relationships he created led to many positive outcomes and critical incidents. Now, therefore, in true spirit of appreciation for nearly 22 years of dedicated service to the city of Batavia, the City Council of the City of Batavia does hereby make this proclamation to sincerely thank Jason Davis for his dedicated service to our community and wish him all the wealth in your retirement.
Attorney's Report. City Manager's Report. Thank you, Council President. Just a few items to note. The Police Station Feasibility Study is scheduled to be finalized in June and presented to the City Council. Right now, um, we're looking through the market for materials. Uh, for wood and steel is so volatile that predicting the prices is becoming quite challenging. Um, we know that the new station will fit on the site um, in terms of its size and what needs to occur in there with our police force. So we're looking forward to be able to present that in June um, to City Council. Also continuing is the Jackson Square DRI Enhancement Project with Architectural Resources, the architectural firm selected to design and engineer the project. They're almost finished with a final design concept. And the next step will be a community engagement session, similar to the first one they did. Um, I'm not sure if it'll be in person or in Zoom, but we'll certainly let you know when that occurs. And after that, we garner more community input. We'll be moving towards engineering and then finally construction. But the outdoor concert series, if it can occur, um, should be safe to occur this year in Jackson Square. There was vaccinations available as of this morning at GCC and in Orleans County, so I wanted to do a quick public service announcement that anyone that is eligible, which is everyone over the age of 16 and or 18, depending on the vaccination type, um, can sign up at Genesee County Department of Health's website. So I believe there are still appointments available. Um, just a friendly reminder to any applicants that do want to utilize our parks for this summer, they need to turn in their applications to us, get their insurance and their COVID safety plans. The state budget has passed and restored the City of Batavia's AIM aid to 100%. VLT funds as well, however, we're not assured of what level yet because it's not called out specifically in the bill, so we hope to know that soon. And as you're aware, the federal government passed the $1.9 trillion COVID relief bill. The federal stimulus funds for Batavia will be approximately $1.58 million, spread over two years. The current guidelines suggest that the funds can be used for sewer, water, and broadband infrastructure projects, or to assist municipalities that lost revenue due to COVID. However, formal guidance is expected to be issued by May 10th, so I'll talk more about that when we know more. Uh, also included in the state budget was an historical increase in CHIPS aid. This year, the, the city is scheduled to address North Spruce, Chase Park, and Fisher Park, and may be able to add microservicing of two streets, Garden Drive and Allen View, into their planning. All of these projects were noted in the city's five-year road capital projects plan. Next year, the city will focus on Harvester and Richmond. There is also state touring routes funds that we're seeking information on out of the state budget that may be able to assist with improvements on Route 98 South. That's my update. Any questions? Any questions? Good, thank you. Thank you. Committee reports? Public comments. All speakers should have signed up in advance. With the city clerk, each speaker will please use the podium up front. Uh, once you get up there, you can remove your mask so it would be easier for us to hear. And then please put your mask on when you go back to the seat. Please state your name and address beginning your, uh, before you begin your statement. Each speaker will be limited to five minutes. Please address your comments to the chair. Council will not engage in debate with the speaker. On the first bell, that means you have 30 seconds left. Please wrap it up because after the second bell, which is the total five minutes, I'm going to have to stop you. And I, it's awkward when I have to do that in mid-sentence. Um, call your first person up. The first was from John Roach. It was an email I received. He said, well, it looks like the state budget will give the city of Batavia its VLT money. I would ask that if the money really comes through, it will not be used to fund any vacant personal, personnel positions. If it is used for that, what would happen next year if the state pulls the money again? I would ask council to use the VLT money to either pay down debt, equipment replacement, or put towards the new police headquarters. John Roach. Uh, Mary Ellen Wilbur.
My name is Mary Ellen Wilbur. I'm speaking on behalf of my sister, who is 71 years old, and lives at Fish 15 Fisher Park. The reason I am here is because, um, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to address the city council. When we all took our road tests and took our driver's ed, and if I'm, please understand me, I'm not trying to be facetious, but as I recall that we all learned, and I know there's a police officer, a former police officer in the room, we were told that drivers must have complete control of their vehicles at all time. That was the number one rule I was taught when I took my course, when I took driver's ed, and ever since I've been driving for almost 50 years. We were also always told that pedestrians had the right of way, especially when they were in a crosswalk. And that we were always supposed to be cautious. My greatest fear was ever hitting a child. Scares the heck out of me even now. So I'm speaking today for my sister Michelle Gaylord, who went crossing the street with three of her grandchildren, a 15-year-old, Vincent Paul Gaylord, an 11-year-old, Thomas Michael Gaylord, and her 11-month-old granddaughter, Christiana Jean McGuire. She was crossing from the Main Street side, closest to St. Joe's, over Ross Street, and you have a little diagram I put in front of you, okay? And the little people are my sister and her children, her grandchildren, and they were in the crosswalk, crossing across Ross Street, the light, they waited for it to turn red. A woman came to the stop sign, the stop light, stopped for a second and then proceeded to go through the light, striking my sister as she moved the, the thank God it was an Eddie Bauer, stroller away because it had shock absorbers. She fell into the road, the kids jumped back, and the vehicle, the lady just was, oh my goodness, she hit my sister. She said, oh, are you okay? And proceeded to go on her merry way. The two cars behind, the witnesses, called the police. My sister was so shaken, she was so worried about the kids, she waited on the side to her son Joshua Gaylord, came to pick them up. Nonetheless to say that the police in our city of Batavia chose not to ticket the woman who drove, chose not to believe my sister, chose not to believe the two witnesses, chose not to even talk to the 11-year-old boy, Thomas, who when he told his teacher at uh, Robert Morris today confirmed the fact that, oh no, Thomas, drivers are always supposed to be in control and you never, ever, ever hit a pedestrian. And pedestrians always have the right of way. So that reinforced this kid that had nightmares and said to his Nana, Nana, I should have jumped in front of that car to save you and, and gotten hit. He's had nightmares. Okay, two witnesses called the police department. My sister called and spoke to Officer Cowan, who said to her, well, there was no report and there was no damages. You didn't go to the hospital. And my sister who's been a nurse and served this community for 35 years at the VA hospital, ha helping veterans. And you all know that. You know me, that I've served this community on the City Charter Review Commission and as a youth board member for six years. People that haven't lived in this community don't know the Zangy girls, okay? But you know that we have served this community on honest people. This person, Mr. Cohen, Officer Cohen, told my sister, huh, we know your sister. She called to speak to Chief Highbush. He's not going to talk to her anyway. See, there's a resentment from what happened to my brother. And I put people in their place when I said he giggled, Chief Highbush, at my brother because my brother had OCD and PTSD. And he said my brother was mentally ill with his giggle. But my brother, at that time, did something to help the police department, as he always had in all the emergencies that happened in Batavia. But that, that's, not, that's not either there. This woman, my niece, whose daughter was in the, involved in this, she called for information on the accident. She has to foil the report, okay? She's an attorney and the pu assistant public defender in Livingston County, well-respected member of the community. Her daughter was involved in this accident. Couldn't get a report. My sister can't get any information. Ridiculous. You know the laws. Drivers have to be in control of their car. Pedestrians have the right of way. This woman was not given a ticket. My family can't do anything about finding any information. What is wrong with the police department in the city of Batavia? And why do kids not respect the police? There's clear evidence. I don't know. 
You tell me what's going on in the city of Batavia. Thank you very much for your time. I am moving back to the city of Batavia. Wendy Walker. <coughs> My name is Wendy Walker, and I live on 62 Otis Street. We received uh, an increase in the assessment of our house today, and I'm here to protest that and contest that assessment. I don't know how that was made or why the increase to such a dramatic amount, but the problem being is we live on the south side. I don't know where this money is going, that you're going to be using because the south side has not been improved three streets over from us there's a lot of crime and i think we all know that the whole street is full of a lot of crime there's been nothing cleaned up there's been nothing done the last time i checked and even in the pledge of allegiance in allegiance we say for liberty and justice for all what about my justice where are my taxes going we pay the highest taxes in the nation, and there's nothing, nothing to show for it. Not where I live, not on the south side, no improvements, nothing. And if I'm wrong, I, I surely would be willing to acknowledge my error in saying that, but I don't believe it. I, I don't. And I'm here speaking. A lot of my neighbors are not here, but they feel the same way I feel to the point some of them are re relocating out of the state. People are moving out of New York State for these very issues. And I think that we should take that into consideration in this small little town of Batavia. I don't, I don't understand this. If we're getting all this money from the government and I don't know what that money is necessarily earmarked for, I don't understand all of it, but it would seem we could help the little people in Batavia. My husband is disabled on a fixed income. His money didn't go up. It's not gonna go up like that. If it goes up $12 every five years, that's a lot. I, I don't know. I'm just asking for consideration and thoughtfulness in this matter when you're talking to the little people. I, I pay a lot of taxes. A lot of my money goes out in taxes. And I just appreciate your consideration today. Thank you. Karen Sherman. My name is Karen Sherman. I live at 102 James Street. Wendy Walker is my neighbor. She said everything, all the issues that I pretty much have in concern. I'm a single mom. I provide for my daughter. I don't get food stamps or anything like that. You guys have raised my taxes every year since I bought my house. I get when you buy a house, comes with a lot of maintenance and stuff, but every single year something has gone wrong. New roof, my windows have broken, gutters have come off. You drive by, I know Ron downstairs, he's, he noticed my fence is broken. Can't fix it because I had fixed my furnace and hot water tank. Again, my taxes went up 19,000 last year for well, the assessment. This year you guys are trying to do 30,000. This is becoming very hard for me as a single parent. Again, I do not get assistance. I own my own business. I am trying so hard to do this without having any type of assistance in any shape, way, or form. I've had to pick up two other little odds and ends jobs to try to make ends meet. Again, I just want to know why, where this is going, and answers. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, did, could you maybe touch on, or someone touch on the process to, sure. you know, um, contest and, and sure. an assessment? Yep, and just to be clear, we did not reassess homes last year due to COVID. We did not feel it was fair to ask people to come in to the assessment board of review. So there was no reassessment last year. Um, and the assessor's not here to speak tonight, but I'll speak from my knowledge of it. Um, when you reassess a home, you assess it on value of comparable sales of like homes. And it's all done through formulas and data. Um, it's not done, I don't even see what reassessments are done in our community, just so everyone's aware. I do know there was um, assessment letters that did go out this week. Currently, those homeowners who have gotten the reassessment letters can do 
what's called an informal review. They can call our assessment office. The assessor will gladly speak to you over the phone, on Zoom, or through email to discuss the level of assessment and why. And you can explain um, and challenge why that happens. If you don't find that as a remedy, you can move to Grievance Day, which is the first Thursday after the fourth Tuesday in May. Um, and you can have your assessment formally grieved in front of a board of your peers, residents of the city of Batavia. Right. And this is a normal process, the assessment. They don't just pick houses randomly. They do sections of the city. That's correct. And they try to rotate it around every so many years. I live on Otis Street as well. I got mine increased as well as you did. It, it happened five minutes before I came to the meeting. I opened my letter. Um, so I totally understand that. Um, just so you understand, the, uh, it's not something that they just picked on your house. Um, it was something that was done through a system. And I, we, were, we couldn't remember the last time it was done. I think it's like a five year rotation. We, we do it annually. Yeah. Yeah. Blocks of the right. community. Blocks. Right. It's not the whole community. It's right. The different sections. blocks get done. And every so many years they come back and they start right. over at the yeah. beginning again. Um, so why that happened, you know, today and that, it just, it's the time of year and it's when One other get. note is that the city actually has the lowest percentage of taxes you pay. Um, the county is slightly higher and then the school district, so it's an all-in rate. Um, so, so when you do get reassessed, we are still the smallest percentage of taxes that you pay in property taxes. And it supports services like police, fire, snow plowing, parks and recreation, trails. So the one you really want to complain about is school, because school's out of hand. They need, they need to have their head examined. And, and just, to, just to reiterate that, the problem with the next, um, the, <laughs> go ahead. Okay, well, just so everyone knows, we don't raise taxes. The city does not raise your assessment. Okay, the assessment, everyone in this room that owns a home is entitled to a fair market value assessment. And this is important when you go to sell a home. Now, uh, the assessments you received today do not go into effect for some period of time. The school tax portion of the assessment will go into effect in October, and the city county uh, bill will be May 1st, 2022. What we do at the city level is we set a total budget tax levy. We set an amount. Okay, we're going to tax the citizens, uh, let's say, uh, five and a quarter million dollars. That is broken down then against the assessments. So you take the total tax levy and you break it down uh, against the assessments. We don't raise, I, today I had a call from a, a very concerned citizen and they said, well, you raised my taxes and now you raise my tax assessment so you're double taxing me. No, we're not doing any of that. And uh, the other thing, a couple of things. One, high, high housing sales have driven the cost assessments way up. My assessment today, mine went up, I just figured it out, 42%. And I live in a very modest two-story old home built in 1929. It went up 42%. But that doesn't affect the taxes. Next year, the taxes get broke down against the assessed value. And just to, these are some older bills, but at that point in time, the city levy was five, roughly five and a quarter million. The county levy, levy was 20 and three quarters million. But yet the school district was 19 and a half million. And then the library was 1.4 million. So always get on your property tax. So you can see the city portion, uh, it's pretty darn conservative for all the services we uh, have to offer. Fire, full time fire department. It's, you know, a lot of people working, a lot of people protecting the community, our police department, and everything. All the rest of it. So, if you go in, I mean, you know, you may have extenuating circumstances. You can meet with the assessor initially and save a lot of problems and explain some of the things because the assessor can't go into your home. They can only look at your home and appraise the value. But, like I said, it's not double taxation. The assessed value has nothing to do with the taxes. We set a total tax level, and that will be broken down next year on the total taxable properties. So it's conceivable next year your tax rate per thousand could go down if all things stay equal. Well, and I don't know how long you owned your home, but the last two years, this year we raised 1.38 percent 
due to the COVID and all the shutdown and loss of revenue. The year before that, the state pulled our uh, half a million dollars of our, uh, down, or, uh, our VLT money. At the last minute, the first week of uh, budget talks, they pulled it. So we were, we were strapped. We had no chance to prevent that. The two years before that were zero, zero, no increase. Mm -hmm. And the year before that, we actually lowered taxes because the nursing home got on the tax rolls. That offset that tax levy Mr. Bajakowski was talking about. So it basically spread that out and everybody's taxes went down by a percent and a half, I think, or something. I don't remember the numbers. Rosemary. Fine and dandy what everyone is saying, but government is out of control. We're not doing anything to help these people. Here's a single mother by herself taking care of her daughter. There is a mother, a, a woman, a wife taking care of her husband. Some of you have two incomes coming in. That's fine and dandy for you, but there's people out here that are really hurting and they need help. I don't know what we can do. I know we can't do anything, but they should go to grievance. And really, there's no doubt about it. Schools are out of control. I would like to go to the next school meeting, and I want to know if any of you want to join me, because everything is just, just out of control. Government is out of control, period. And as far as our, our budget goes and everything else, we're down 400,000, almost a half a million, even a little bit more than 400,000. And when May comes, you're going to see where people are really hurting because they're not able to pay their taxes. Okay? Thank you. Just a couple of comments. First of all, uh, the, the housing market is what's really driving the assessed value up. Uh, I, have, uh, I have a few friends that are in the housing market, they're looking for new houses, and they're telling me about the horror stories that when they find the house, first of all, they have to react as quickly as possible because the house gets a 25, 30 offers. Uh, and these offers are going, I just read an article today, the, the, these houses are going uh, somewhere between twenty-five and $30,000 over the asking price. And people are coming in with cash. The, the housing market is, is just booming right now. Uh, and that also drives the assessed value because uh, the assessed value, they're trying to base on true market value. And if that's the case, we see what the market is doing right now. That doesn't help you, unfortunately. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer a little bit of advice. My father gave me this advice years and years ago, and I've used it. I definitely sign up uh, for Grievance Day and go in there, but don't go in there and just say, I can't afford, I can't afford this raise, please help me out. It's not going to work. You've got to do your homework. Uh, if you go online, if you're able to go online, um, you can access the Genesee County site. You can access houses in your neighborhood. You can access houses in other neighborhoods that are similar to your house and compare the assessed values of those houses to the assessed value of your house. Uh, if there's houses in your, in your neighborhood, like in my neighborhood, that are in the exact same floor plan as my house on a similar size piece of property um, with similar features, that's what you want to do. You want to compare how those other houses are assessed versus your house and the similarities, because that's basically what the assessors do. They look at comparable houses and, and they assess them, like Bob says, they can't come into your house, they don't know what's in it, they can only assess it from the outside. So do your homework, um, and, and like I say, you can do that right on the Genesee County website. You can find, I was just on there because I got my assessment in the mail right before I came here, and I got on the Genesee County site to see the house across the street from me and the house next door to them, they're all the same floor plans. They are all built in the 1970s, the same floor plans, and I wanted to see what their assessment was as well. So you can compare that. And I've gone in and I've argued in the past with the assessor that why is my house being assessed higher than the house across the street or the house next door that's the same exact plan, and, 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 and ask them that question. So you, you go in with, with ammunition as to why you feel that your house is being uh, assessed higher than other people's houses, if that's the case. So do your homework. Anyone else? 
The next thing I want to talk about is Mary Ellen Wilbur and the report. Is she going to be able to get a report from that accident? Um, we certainly can look into it. I would ask that the individual involved be the one that we release information to. Please do. Okay, I think she deserves to have that report. I'll probably call. May we just ask one more question? Go ahead. Is that allowed? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so we did look up online and now trying to see square footage and everything because of my house is a ranch. And the thing is, the outside of my house is stucco. There's not a lot of houses around that look like mine that are ranches, so I have to side mine to look like everything else, which is eventually going to happen because nobody does the old fashioned stucco anymore. But I've seen ranges from 86 all the way to 200,000, so how do I compare mine? to everything else. So I think the best thing to do is to call the assessor right away tomorrow morning and they will walk you through the website and show you comparable values and listen to what you have to say, what improvements you have or have not done, make sure they've got the right rate um, for your home. And they will, they, she is there to help you. She is not there to um, challenge you in any way. They're there to help you do comparables on it. And that's the best way to do it. I don't know that the materiality of it makes a difference. Well, it's, it's worth at least starting the process because the longer you're a homeowner, you're going to go through this process every five years anyway. So it's a good thing to know and learn your way through. We want to help you. Uh, Rachel, I want to suggest if you call the assessor, if she's not in here at the city, try the town building. We okay. use the same assessor, so okay. the so hours are trying to split up. I don't, I don't know if you can take the call there. Yes, yeah, they do. They will. Brian does. All right, Rachel, if you could look into Ms. Wilbur's complaint with the police department and the whole thing and then the report, you can check into that off grid here and then get back to her. I'm sure the police department would be happy to get back to the individual involved in the incident. Right, right. Yeah, and that's the person that they want the answers for. Right. So. Anything else? Yeah, I don't know. Just go back to the accident. I mean, I didn't understand what she said. Was it, did she run the red light? Did she make a right turn? She turned right, right on red, and, but she didn't. She There were pedestrians in the crosswalk. So she well, had the sign say no right on yeah, red? Yeah, there's no right on red. There's no right on red. Does that make sure to hit run? No. Oh, no. They didn't run. There's right on red. There's no right on red. Not on cross. Not on cross. And she left. She got out of her car. I can just tell you, my sister is still black and blue from on her back. She said, are you okay? And my sister's like picking herself up and moving the baby and the kids out of the street. She said, well, I guess so. And the people behind that, so it was a big SUV, black SUV. They are the ones that called the police. And then another person called the police and they gave the reports to the police department. So my sister, Michelle Gaylord, called the police, talked to the officer, I, I said, and asked and Well, why don't, we let, why don't we let Rachel look into yeah, it? Yeah, look into it, get please. Back to you. Uh, what we know is our reports have to be found in our report. Yeah, we have to get back to your sister. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So she has called and get back to the mother of the baby who called, who was told they had to foil the report. Well, that, that's, we'll find out what's going on. We'll make sure this gets Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate There's it. There's obviously some miscommunication there. So I would say so. Well, the city manager will look into it and get back to you. I will choose the first office I call. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Unfinished business. Bob, did you cover it? Yes. 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 Just so you know, Bob was going to cover this anyway, and it was perfect that he was able to explain it with people who had complained. Because the tax levy and the way the assessment goes, is, it's confusing sometimes. So. Uh, and as everyone knows, homes have gone through the road. Uh, two by four, that was $2.89 a year and a half ago. Now it's running between nine to $10. Builders, uh, builders in Rochester are saying if you want to build a brand new conservative two-story home, $400,000. Yeah, because COVID stopped all the production of lumber and then everybody was buying lumber. I just because they were remodeling during the shutdown and it was Home Depot had a line by a lot of lumber. One of Al's neighbors, their home just was sold for, uh, just, uh, I think it was $178,000. A few houses up, I don't know. So you'll probably get assessed for 
200,000. <laughs> I mean, the, the good news is the market's going up and yeah. the value is there. The bad news is that it's the other side. It's only good for a certain amount of houses from like 100 something to 200 something. Yeah. Not for any more expensive houses. So, yeah, that's kind of false. Oh. Yeah. So, medium income medium houses. Medium income houses, right. 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 Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Um, I asked uh, George this evening uh, if he had any information for me concerning the beer and the wine license for the farmer's market. He was on vacation. And uh, he was also busy, and he would get that information for me for the next meeting, thank right. goodness. I also wanted to know about Severinos. We were going to do some at the end of March if nothing was done. I don't see any shovels. I don't see any work over there. Where are we with that? It was just in the paper. Just in the paper. Yeah, it was, but... But... If you'd like me to, I'd be happy to discuss what I'm aware of. Um, we had a meeting with um, Sabrino Companies and Sam Sabrino specifically, with myself, the BDC, and the GCEDC, and they are finalizing their documents for closing in um, by May or June. I voiced the displeasure of counsel in the time and length it has taken, and that the patience has worn extremely thin. And he said he understands and received the message. So he paid for his permit already? Yeah. yeah, he paid yeah. the city for his permits. Yeah. The permits expire in July 21st, 2021, um, and I will not authorize the extension of those. Okay. So the manager can authorize extension. Thank you. Okay. So we're, we're at the end. It's it, something that has to happen soon, or we'll know one way or another. But I'm confident, and we're confident that he's going to close in May and start moving on that as soon as possible right there after. I sincerely hope he can follow through. You sure have to be Okay, resolution 30, 2021. Ms. Pacino. Thank you, Mr. President. I move a resolution to create a temporary position of superintendent of water and wastewater. Seconded by Mr. Guinness. Any questions or concerns? Councilmember Castino? Yes. Canale? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Briggs? Yes. Christian? Yes. Karaz? Yes. Bialkowski? Yes. Jankowski? Yes. Bealy? Yes. Okay. Resolution 31, 2021. Mr. Bealy, please. Thank you, Council President. I move a resolution to allow the Community Garden Committee to submit an AARP Community Challenge Grant application. Second by Mr. Karaz. Any questions or concerns? I have one. Yeah, is this a matching grant? I don't know. Please. What's the challenge? That's just the name of the grant. A challenge grant application. They challenge communities to get involved. Okay, so that that's the word that's the actual title of the grant. Okay, so they don't we don't have to we do not have matching fees in. We do have a budget line item for the garden of a thousand dollars separately. Right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Councilmember Bealy? Yes. Castino? Yes. Canale? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Briggs? Yes. Christian? Yes. Karras? Yes. Bayakowski? Yes. Jankowski? Yes. Resolution 32, 2021, the lime sludge. Mr. Canale, please. Thank you, Council President. I move a resolution to award a contract for removal, transportation, and disposal of liquid lime sludge. Second to Ms. Kirkman. Any questions or concerns? Yes. Uh, I'd like to know and when the contract says uh, states it's awarded to the AD, AD Call Stafford and New York for $9,340 per event. What, uh, I'd like a definition of per event. Sure, and I, I would try to answer that, but I'm going to go to Ray because I think it's um, typically we only do it once a year unless no, we get it. It's, it's, it's six months a year. <laughs> Where they come in, they uh, basically remove the lime sediment from the lime bed and all the way through disposal. Uh, so we, we've we've done it six times in, in previous years, and we have it basically budgeted for about six and a half times uh, this year. Okay, so uh, 
and it's roughly the same given amount of lime sliced on. Pretty, yeah, pretty much. Right. Fifty-four thousand a year, fifty-five thousand. Is it sixty in, in the budget for it? Okay, thank you. I was going to say I thought we budgeted some for sixty some thousand for that. No matter what. So we're under, we're, we're doing good, but it's a fair price, that's what you're saying. Okay, any other questions? <coughs> yes. You want to call the vote, please? Council Member Canale? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Briggs? Yes. Christian? Yes. Perez? Yes. Bykowski? Yes. Dankowski? Yes. Bailey? Yes. Casino? Yes. Okay, motion to adjourn. Mr. Bykowski, seconded by Mr. Perez. All the roll, please. Council Member Bayakowski? Yes. Jankowski? Yes. Bealy? Yes. Casino? Yes. Canale? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Briggs? Yes. Christian? Yes. Perez? Yes. Okay, I now call the order of the special conference meeting. Alabama Trail easements. Yes, the first item on the special council meeting is Ellicott Trail easements. Um, Previously, back in 2016, the City of Batavia Council approved an intermunicipal agreement to split the local cost share of the Ellicott Trail and the completion of the project to maintain a portion of the trail within the city limits with the town of Batavia. Uh, in 2020, you saw an authorization for the final payment of a $196,763, which was our financial contribution to the trail. And what we have in front of us this evening are the easements that we would take on um, for a 30-year term, and we would agree to maintain and operate as a public improvement, and the trail would continue to be restricted from vehicular access. So the easements are 665 East Main Street, Batavia Gardens, Ellicott Station, and Elmwood Cemetery. And all those copies are in here for you to read. The one question I had when it defines in the city limits, does that mean the park within the DeWitt Park? No. So DeWitt Park is not included in that specifically. The county will maintain that portion of the trail. And Ray, correct me if I'm wrong on any portion of this. Um, so it would just be within the city limits. Where so technically, the park is in the city limits. That's why I asked. It doesn't carve it. Right, it goes. It's a county park, so it's under county. So being a county park that covers that part. Pearl Street to Cedar Street, and that's why it stops at Cedar Street. Right. So good question. Uh, all right. The, uh, the other question is, do we, when do we have scheduled time to maintain the trail? Uh, because I went in the other, drove it the other day, and the park from Jackson to Pearl Street is is pretty rough. Washed out. It's pretty washed out, and uh, there was debris. There's uh, surgical masks laying on the side of the road. Um, you know, now that's the new thing. It's all the COVID. Everybody's throwing their masks away or they're falling out of their pockets. And this waste is laying around on our streets now. And uh, there's some on the trail itself. So, I, I mean, I know it's spring. And I'm not saying that it looks like it, it's got spring, that winter look to it. I'm just curious, what's our timetable? Do we need to maybe put together some volunteers? I mean, what, what do we need to do to get So there's it? multiple answers. We need to accept the easements, number one. Right now, the town of Batavia has committed to going over areas that have been washed out. Um, number two, there is a group of volunteers who plan to go down the trail and help clean up, led by John Roach um, of Adam Miller Toys as well. I don't know if that group's up and functional, but I'll certainly reach out tomorrow on that. Um, and then from then on, we will have ongoing maintenance that will coincide with our parks activity in the spring and summer. Uh, yeah, uh, I asked the manager today to uh, confer with Ray. Uh, just so people realize, with everything the city adds on, there's a cost. And I asked if we could have a, a rounded out annual cost to maintain this because there's uh, gravel has to be put down and replaced, tree limbs have to be uh, you know, trimmed and uh, manicured, and uh, signs have to be replaced. So, I, I think. Uh, yeah, I have the answer, but Ray, chime in. Uh, about 7,000 in materials every five years. And then we have um, using our workforce that we already employ to do maintenance on an annual basis. Um, he, Ray thinks it would take about a week um, out of their time throughout the entire season. 
and there will be mowing that will be added along the trail as well. And Ray, if you have anything to add, please do. No, I think you, you, you've got it. I think you're about six, uh, eight to ten times a year that we'll have additional mowing. Um, what we'll add to, uh, it takes us about four days in order to mow all the city property. Um, so along that line, uh, every couple of weeks we would probably throw uh, one more mower down in that area. Um, I would leave roughly five days, probably not this season because everything has been cut back pretty severely last year. Um, you know, if, if we have a heavy growth, probably two guys in order to go along the course of the uh, trail and, and trim, uh, probably figure a week's worth of time uh, for two guys in order to do that. Uh, as for materials, we're going to still have to kind of figure it out. It is, it is new. Um, the town's idea is that we should be able to go five years without putting a, a new top on it, um, another layer of uh, stone dust. Um, but there are some washout areas that they've committed to repairs on this year. So, so what will be the annual labor cost for it? Uh, it's going to be in probably around $4,000 annually, then you're going to have a bump when we go ahead and uh, do that recap uh, at around five years. So you've got about a week. Week's worth of work there also. I have a question. Now, if you notice some college campuses that have these blue lights on there for emergencies, do we have anything back there for these young girls walking? Because there are a lot of idiots out there, you know, that could be hiding in the woods or whatever, whatnot. I mean, I'm just concerned with safety. Of girls jogging, running, walking, whatever. There's nothing there, like you said, a college campus that has a blue light on top of it. If there's some Scumbag out there that wants to do something to run through and call the well, cops. Most most people I know, including my wife, carry the cell phone. Well, some girls run around the cell phone. I'm just saying. The girls with college carry cell phones. They got blue lights everywhere. Well, I'm just telling you, it's pretty open, and I think that was the, why they cut the trees. I'm just asking a question. I know. Well, and, and I'm just looking from a security perspective. I I feel safe walking a trail because I have a view of about a hundred yards in each direction. It's not like someone could just jump out of the way. Oh, my bodies. That's actually, that's I'm actually, just, I'm, just, just, I mean, I'm just saying it's a concern, but I don't think that's an expense they put into the park, was to have lights and, and emergency lights. I mean, they don't have it on the streets, people use cell phones. It's something to take into consideration, but. I think it's a valid point, and I've thought about well, it. Well, it is a valid point. point. I know it's a lot of people don't carry cell phones, they're giant, some do. There's some may carry a pistol with them when they're walking, I don't know. Why are you going to me when you said it? We got no girls. Why are you going to me? Some people carry a pistol when they walk. Why are you going to me? Anyway, uh, speaking of a real hazard on the trail, um, whether you have a gun on or not, it's still a dangerous place to cross, is on Cedar Street. And I, and I think you need to have somebody look at that, Rachel, all seriousness. Because when you come up, it's guiding you to cross on the other side of the hill. Yes. So the Main Street traffic coming down Main Street, you can't see that traffic from that location. And I know enough to like cross down the road more, but if you follow the trail, it wants you to cross on the downslope near the overpass where the train tracks are. And, and your blind spot is that left side. It should be more even where the park entrance is. It should be right across from that, and then you're safer, because then you can see both. You're at the top of the hill, you can see both directions. So I meant to bring that up to it. I should have mentioned that to you earlier. Um, but if you can just maybe get together and grab it's just a marking issue. If remarking it to move it over, and it's like maybe 30 feet, make a huge difference as far as safety, especially with a bicycle when you're trying to get started. You want to know there's no car coming over that hill. Yeah, I think I. When I did it, I walked up and crossed where you enter the park. Right, and most people track. would, but I mean, the park should be, it should direct people that way if right. possible. That, that's just the I'm sure we can look at it. Okay, if you could do that. Any other questions or concerns about this? I just wanted to get back to my original point. So we're looking at about a cost of 5,500 a year of labor and materials. And, you know, I think sometimes uh, the citizenry is a little confused or they don't understand because they think we have a whole bunch of guys just hanging out at DPW every day, drinking coffee and all that. You know, uh, it's a pretty sparse operation now. The guys are really out there working. So when people come up with ideas like, well, who's going to maintain it? What the DPW guys doing? 
Yeah, there are no TPW guys. There's not like a big reserve of people <laughs> sitting down on Walnut Street with nothing to do. And uh, if people would just pitch in, like you said, you know, there's mass laying all over the place, pick up your car. I mean, I was like willing to organize some kind of cleanup. If somebody's going to do that, that's a good thing. But at the same token, this was all discussed, I remember, at length when the trail was going to be built. And they looked at the, the gain to outweigh the cost because it was something we've never had before, and it's, it's treated like another park. I mean, it is a nine-mile-long park that you can jump on at different sections, and it's extremely well used. I mean, the other day we went and took a ride, and there were there had to be a couple hundred people on that trail on Saturday, um, all linked the whole long of the trail. There are constantly people on that trail. So it's worth it, and I think it's something good for the people to do, and it came in handy. During COVID, it gave people a place to go and walk. It was even twice as amount used during last March as it was this March. So, just something safer in the streets. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a good thing to have, and I think it will build on it as it gets. We take ownership of it, and the public takes ownership of it, and maybe it'll start getting improved even more. So. Just a, just a thought along those lines when you say the public will take ownership of it. Uh, you know, we we just see it all the time all over the country where certain uh, groups, whether it be a youth group of some sort, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, uh, a social organization, they adopt a highway kind of thing. And they maintain that as far as cleaning it up. And, you know, we might, somewhere down the road, may want to look at offering some various local groups, especially groups of young people, um, that might want to take on a project like that and say, you know, this is our portion of the trail that we're going to adopt and, and every spring we're going to go and, and do cleanup. And that's a community project for a lot of um, schools who want to have community projects as part of their graduation. Part. I know right. Notre Dame does that stuff too. So great idea. It's new. It's only the second year and the first year got off to a rough start because of COVID. So hopefully we can get these paperwork done uh, like we're doing today. We can then start building on that kind of exact same thing. You can clean and maintain and spring clean up or whatever we want to do. Earth Day, anything. Earth Day, that's right. We've been doing that for years. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything like that. Any other questions or concerns on this? So are we in consensus to move this to the special business meeting, which will be, um, when is it, the 26th, I believe? Right? So if we can move that to this. You're all in consensus for that? Yeah. That gets moved over. Um, now, the other item is the wastewater uh, air system. Yes. So, part of the 2021 capital project plan, which is a, was approved by council, is to replace the air header system at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, the system introduces supplemental air to the <coughs> primary wastewater ponds, provides oxygen in the ponds to effectively digest waste. Right now, we are getting only 20% air into that at 100%, um, which is why you may notice an odor um, near the ponds or in neighborhoods near the ponds um, because the system is not working properly. We knew that it needed to be replaced. We thought we had a little more time, um, but it has come uh, to need replacement immediately. Um, and Ray, do you want to offer any more technical details? I think you, you pretty much know that it's a Schedule 40 galvanized uh, steel line that runs from uh, the main plant where uh, air pumps run, then pumps air under the ground <coughs> alongside the ponds, and their fingers will go out to the ponds. So there's diffusers like the air bubbler in a fish tank. Um, what has happened is it should be up to about 40 years worth of life in that pipe. Um, we're only getting 30 years out of it. Um, it's leaking through the joints. It's actually leaking through the side walls of it. Um, if you go out there on a rainy day, you'll see the parking lot bubbling. Meanwhile, you need the ponds bubbling. So we desperately need to get that air back into the ponds so we get effective digestion uh, going on. Um, it had been something that had been uh, targeted and forecasted as part of the capital plan. We would normally just be kicking uh, underway right now to get a consultant on board, but we recognize this past winter um, how severe it was becoming, and that's the reason why we'll be opening bids on Monday. Okay. So, somewhat of a semi emergency. Now, I noticed you're going to be doing it in sections, I guess. You're going to start with the closest section to the building and work your way out 
to the remotest area, so you'll yeah. kind of be cleaning it up as you go along. It runs from 16 inches all the way down to a six inch line at the third pond. So what the intent here is to give that 16 inch line in, in place, valve it off, um, so it can actually function in re-aerate pond one, then we go ahead and work on two. Get two done, open the valve on that one, aerate two, finish up on three, well, close the business. Then we actually take a look at the remainder of the air system because the original project is to take a look at the compressors and to take a look at the computer uh, diffusers in the pond. Right now we don't have enough air getting to the pond in order to look at the diffusers. Right. So this will be phase one of possibly three more phases or two more phases. Just so you know, so this will come back a, a couple more times before it's finally the project's complete. And hopefully it can last another minimum 30 to 40 years. We're taking, we're taking some steps in order to put some uh, safeguard protection so it does not react with the soils. Um, this will be wrapped uh, in material in order to grow that back. So. Okay. We, we have reserves for this, correct? Yeah. It's coming out of uh, water, I believe, right? Right. Wastewater. 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 From the sewer pump. And yes, yeah. we do have reserves to do the project. It's fully funded. And that's what they're in there for. Right. You understand these things over there. Go constantly go at the end. Well, and, and we're putting, and then also understand we're putting money away for this rainy day, so we don't have to bottom this out. Well, so. This goes back to, and, and it comes up every year at budget time, and I know it's been a concern of, of Rosemary's as well. Uh, why, do, why are we continually raising the water and sewer rates? This is the reason why. It has to, right. We do it a little at a time, so we have this reserve fund for when these types of things come up. So right. we're not raising taxes to do those projects. Or, or bonding them out. Bonding them out. Taking on debt and whatnot. So uh, also, as you'll notice, the resolution has X's in it. By the time we vote on this on the 26th, the names will be filled in, the bids will be open, and all that vetting process will have occurred, and we'll have a name and we'll have a price in there. OK, so just so you know, that's why it's set up that way now. Any other questions then? No. Concerns? So we're in consensus to move this to the special business on the 26th. Yes. Um, that'll be uh, NBRC grant for Bank Street water line improvements. Yep, so as we look at cohesive development around the city, including Bank Street, where uh, we're looking at the Elba Place parking lot for the police station, and also um, we have developers continually interested in where the Bank of America drive through, as Bank of America knows, um, they, we looked at the water lines there and realized that they need to be upsized to ensure that we have the correct fire suppression and can service any type of new growth in the area. So there is a grant available um, that we'd like to apply for. It's called the Northern Border Regional Commission Grant. Um, they partner with New York State Department of, of State and they offer funding for between eight and 10 projects in New York every year. We had a pre-eligibility determination call. Um, the gentleman we spoke to uh, thought we were eligible and thought because it was a downtown project and fostered both public and private investments after the water line was done that it would be good for us to submit for it. So we are, the total project cost is about $410,000 and we're going to be um, Replacing, I have an error in my memo, it's a current four inch and six inch line to an eight inch line. Uh, the city would need to provide a local match of $82,000, which would be from the water fund, if this grant was awarded and we move forward with the project. Uh, Ray gave me some facts. The lines right now are 90 to 100 years old. He thinks they've lived their effective lives. Um, they've had at least five breaks on the system over the last 30 years, with the most recent a year or so ago. Um, there's definitely been other service line breaks um, that have happened as well. So it's a way to clean up that area, and if we ever were to do streetscape improvements in that area, as the Y builds across the street, and we look at development of the police station, we'd want to have the infrastructure done first and have the water done first there. Good. So, is that, Rachel, is, is that going to be like from... Washington Avenue to, to Main Street. Street. That's correct. Yep. Because we did, did we not replace sewer lines on the other part of Main Street when we did that street? No, you actually replaced sewer on, sewer on that section also back in 2009. 
but not the water. This is just water. Oh, okay. So, yeah. But we replaced the water lines, though, did we not, on Bank Street from Washington North? I believe we were transferred over on services. I think that I, I believe that was just transferring the, the water services over to one main, and I think uh, there is an eight-inch main up there. So uh, I'm sorry, my mind's starting to fail. That was so long ago. So <laughs> that was primarily a sewer job in my 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 eyes back at that that time. I was a sewer guy, just a sewer guy. But there is a modern eight-inch eight inch main on Bank Street, you're correct. Now, Rachel, did, what, how would this stimulus infrastructure funding, would this be something that would call for the project? If for some reason this grant doesn't come I forward? wouldn't recommend it because this wasn't on our long-term capital plan in terms of identified needs. This is more of a project development cost that oh. likely may need to happen with a police station move. Right. Um, so it enables that and it enables future development. So I feel that it's more appropriate to go after grant funds at this time. Um, and if, you know, when we decide how we're going to move forward with the stimulus funds from the federal government to look at our priority projects in the rate study, in the capital planning and rate study first. And this was not listed okay. as one of them. Because I remember at one point that this was a DRI it was. project yep. to do the streetscape and the uh, underneath infrastructure right. and the state, you know, said that it might be better used as, as, with other monies so that they didn't, they didn't like that project. It wasn't a this, final uh, selected. Because right, yeah. it was more of underground, it wasn't really building reconstruction or anything, so. Yep. Got it. That's what I thought. Okay, any other questions on that? I'd just like to say it's a pleasure to actually put money into real infrastructure. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so we're in consensus to move this out to the special business. Um, okay, anything else I'd like to add? Okay, uh, Mr. Bealy is making a motion to adjourn, seconded by Mr. Canale. If you would call the roll, please. Councilmember Bealy? Yes. Cena? Yes. 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 Yes.